Hi, and welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins, and we're glad you decided to join us for another journey into the world of cybersecurity. For those that are new to this show and are wondering what it's all about, Cybersecurity Today is the only TV show dedicated to understanding the themes and topics affecting computer security. Our goal is to bring you relevant content within the cybersecurity world that can impact you, your family, and even the organization that you work for today. Okay, so first off, I have a quick announcement. I'd like to let you know that Mr. Christopher Vias, who we've had on the show previously, is joining the program as a co-host and correspondent. Chris is a highly experienced cybersecurity professional and an all-around good guy. So we're super excited to have him join our team and lend a hand to make this show even better. You'll see Chris on many episodes moving forward, sometimes in the studio and sometimes out in the field. Now, let's talk about today's episode. We have two segments planned for you today. The first segment is going to be our standard Cyber News Bites section, where we bring you current events in the cybersecurity market. Both Chris and I will be covering relevant news stories and potentially adding some commentary. For the second segment, we're super excited to have retired Brigadier General Gregory Tuhill coming on this show to talk about something known as Zero Trust. If you've not heard about Zero Trust, we'll get into it and explore what it means to you and the organization that you work for. We're happy you're spending some time with us today and we'll do our best to make it worth your time. We'll be back in just a moment for the first segment. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Food, it brings us together, inspires joy, and gives us life. But we can't forget that during this crisis, over 37 million people don't have access to nutritious food. That's one in 12 seniors and one in seven children. In fact, millions of kids aren't able to receive a free or reduced price school lunch right now. The good thing is, we can all help. Learn how you can get involved at feedingamerica.org. When we help each other, we nourish ourselves, our families, and our communities. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins. Greetings, everyone. I'm Christopher Villas. Chris, it's great to have you here on the show today. Thanks, Jim. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get into the actual Cyber News Bites, where we're going to talk about what's going on in the cybersecurity community. Our first story that we're going to talk about deals specifically with ransomware. It turns out that reports are surfacing of ransomware attackers that are targeting popular cloud backups used by organizations. As part of the targeted efforts, attackers will compromise the cloud backup access through usual means using technologies like key logging, credential dumping, social engineering, and armed with that information, the attacker will compromise the backup before launching their ransomware attack, hoping to make the victim more likely to pay their ransom. Kind of scary, huh? That's fascinating. Good reminder to use two-factor authentication as well. Absolutely. Also this week, federal lawmakers heard from telecom executives at Senate Commerce Committee hearing on 5G supply chain security. Washington is searching for alternatives to prevent Chinese firms such as ZTE and Huawei from establishing key market share in the country as the U.S. looks to build out its 5G wireless networks. Concerns about Chinese-supplied 5G infrastructure center on a 2017 Chinese intelligence law that requires Chinese companies and citizens to assist in state intelligence work if requested. Hmm, that's interesting. Concerning. Absolutely. Yeah, the 5G environment's a lot of uh, opportunity there, but also obviously a lot of risk. Absolutely. In another news article in the UK, a free Wi-Fi service available at rail stations has exposed the personal information of roughly 10,000 people, according to the BBC. The information was in a database on an unsecured cloud storage location, something that comes up regularly in these types of incidents. Information that was uh, uh, leaked contained elements such as email addresses, software and device types connected to the network, and usernames. While no passwords were exposed, the information would be enough to put together someone's travel patterns. For example, a strong reminder for us to be careful when using public wireless networks. Hopefully everybody's using you know, encryption and doing all the kind of best yeah, practices. Yeah, or even a VPN if you're very concerned about it. Absolutely. 
Closer to home, a similar cloud misconfiguration left a database containing more than 200 million records with a wide range of property-related information on U.S. residents open on the Internet without any authentication requirements. The database included information such as names, addresses, emails, and credit ratings, but also things like property information such as home value, number of bedrooms. While much of this information may have been available in public records in various places, having it all together in one location and linked together makes it a good tool for bad actors to craft convincing phishing emails and other things of that nature. Um, enabling strong two-factor authentication where possible will help thwart you know, phishing attacks that use this kind of information. Yeah, it's interesting uh, how the, you know, the aggregation of information is now starting to be used as a tool to ultimately compromise people and organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, in another news article, more security woes for Intel as a new vulnerability is disclosed that leads to an unfixable flaw within uh, the many chips that have been released in the past five years. Unlike the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities that plagued Intel in 2017, this new vulnerability is not easily fixable with a firmware update. It affects a very specific portion of the chip called the Converged Security and Management Engine Intel does have some guidance and mitigation available and cautions that the vulnerability, while difficult to fix, is also difficult to exploit without physical access and specialized hardware. It's a big challenge for a lot of companies that might have invested in, uh, in that hardware. Absolutely. After a rocky start with the Iowa caucus, the Super Tuesday elections in 2020 appear to have been largely successful and without major interruption by foreign adversaries. However, according to a joint statement issued by a coalition of federal agencies and organizations on March 2nd, quote, foreign actors continue to try to influence public sentiment and shape voter perceptions, end quote. Multiple agencies, including the DOJ, DOD, DHS, and intelligence community are continuing to coordinate and improve on efforts to monitor and protect our elections. The statement goes on to employ voters to also do their part in protecting our elections, stating, quote, we encourage all voters going to polls to check the vo your voter registration and know ahead of time when to vote, where to vote, what's on your ballot, and whether your state requires an identification. A well-informed and vigilant republic is the best defense against disinformation." End quote. For more information, check with your state and local election officials office and visit cisa.gov slash protect 2020. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Chris. Uh, so that brings us uh, and brings you up to speed on what's happening in the cybersecurity industry. We'll be back after a short break with our discussion with retired General, uh, Brigadier General Gregory Tuhill. Thanks for staying with us. We'll see you in a moment. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. But now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome, we need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. And welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. Our next segment on today's show is going to deal with a topic known as zero trust. Historically, organizations have secured their people, processes, and technologies by establishing a perimeter between their internal organization and the outside world, also known as the internet. A new way of approaching security known as zero trust is changing the paradigm on how organizations look at protecting themselves. We're very fortunate today to be joined by retired Brigadier General Gregory Tuhill, who has spent much of his current professional career working with Zero Trust and other complementary technologies. Today, General Tuhill is president of AppGate, uh, and he is an adjunct professor of cybersecurity at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College. He serves on several advisory boards for organizations in the cybersecurity space, and he was selected by President Obama as the U.S. government's first chief information security officer, known as the CISO. His civilian government service includes Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Cybersecurity and Communications at the Department of Homeland Security and is Director of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. He is a retired Air Force General Officer, a highly decorated combat leader, and a former American diplomat. General Tuhill, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Jim. 
Absolutely. So, you know, maybe to kind of get things going, can you do us a favor and kind of define what we mean by the term zero trust? Well, zero trust is a security strategy that acknowledges that you really can't trust all of your enterprise. And by the way, your information is well outside your enterprise in most cases. It's in hybrid clouds, multiple clouds out there. It's on-premise, it's co-located in data centers, it's on multiple devices. It's in devices that you may issue from your organization. It's on devices that may be a bring your own device type of thing, where it's somebody's personal device. So taking the strategy of not being able to trust every single thing universally uh, and going in with the approach that I'm not going to trust until I authenticate at the very lowest level possible. I'm going to encrypt every, all of my transactions and I'm only going to grant access for what you're authorized to see at that time and date and uh, make sure that I'm continuously checking for my authentication and my authorization. All of those are encapsulated in that zero trust security strategy. Got it. So can you get into a little bit about what kind of organizations might be good candidates? Is it, is it the full spectrum? Is it big businesses, large organizations, small? I think every organization should be engaged in the zero trust security strategy, regardless of your size. And let's not forget that it's not all about the technology. It's about people, and process, and technology. And it starts with your information. Identifying information as an asset is critically important to every organization. And then further, as you are generating uh, information or accumulating it, some people are the custodians of information, you need to identify who has access to that information, who should have access to uh, information, and under what conditions they should have access to information. Too often with our normal defense in depth strategy, we put that hardened shell, that barrier reef around our information. But once you were on the inside, you had access. That's proven to be uh, quite fallible, has been exploited time and time again. And the zero trust security strategy, regardless if it's a paper piece of information or a digital piece of information, encompasses both. Can we get now into a little bit of the historical aspect of how zero trust has evolved? I think you've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but maybe explain why zero trust is kind of replacing perimeter-based defense. Sure, you know, was when we first started out uh, on the digital journey, uh, back when the founders like Vint Cerf and others were creating TCP IP, the Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, um, they were just trying to get it to work. And getting computers to, to communicate with each other was very difficult. And they created the, an exquisite technology uh, for us to use. But security was kind of bolted on afterwards. And uh, the way TCP IP works, and it's still the backbone of the Internet, is it tries to connect you first and then authenticate later. Back in about the 1997-1998 the uh, time frame, I recall uh, DISA engineers putting out a white paper saying, instead of connecting and then authenticating, wouldn't it be great if we could authenticate first and then only connect to what you're authorized to see? We saw during the uh, Cyber Genome Project that uh, DARPA helped lead in the early 2000s, um, and with work down in New Zealand with the Jericho Project, a lot of folks really kind of were gravitating towards that authenticate first and then, then connect to only what you're authorized to see. That's really where we've seen the uh, zero trust security strategy come out of the, that thought leadership and that research. And then finally, in around the 2009-2010 timeframe, John Kindervag, who was at Forrester Research at the time, he zeroed in on the phrase zero trust, uh, but it was a logical pro uh, progression based on the, re uh, the research and the need to really authenticate first and then connect. That makes a lot of sense. Turning maybe towards the business side of the house, how do you, you know, your explanations were, were very well put, but they got into some of the technical uh, language and I, I often wonder if you don't run into some challenges trying to explain zero trust like to a board of directors how do you characterize and define and and put it in a language that they understand well it helps I am on the board of directors in a lot of different organizations and your audience always changes uh, so your your explanation has to be in terms that they understand 
But most folks understand that uh, you have information, information has value, and you want to make sure that you have positive control over that information so that only those who are authorized to see it can see it. And further, you may be, for example, a contractor, a, a third-party contractor in an organization, and your duty hours are from 8 in the morning till 5 in the evening. That's the only time you should be accessing that information. And I, as a board member, want to see, well, how many folks are trying to access that information when they're not supposed to? Um, you want to make sure that you have positive control over that information and that every transaction where I am exchanging information, I have authentication that it is actually Jim Wiggins who is sending me information or it's Jim Wiggins I'm giving information to. And on the same token, you want to make sure that it's Greg Tuhill that you're dealing with. So connecting first and making sure that you have that identity-centric approach to authentication and authorization before you open up the doors to uh, give access to that information is critically important. And when I talk to C-suite officers, when I talk to boards, they get that and it starts a, a more fulsome conversation on zero trust. So you're able to put it in a language that they can understand. Um, are there other benefits that an organization might be able to realize by embracing the construct of zero trust? Absolutely, and you know, one of the things that we've seen is uh, our, our traditional security models are failing. We've just layered layer upon layer upon layer, and we've kept antique uh, and ancient equipment. Marie Kondo has been making a fortune by trying to help folks declutter their closets. I, I'd like to see if we can declutter our security as well. Um, as a fan of Star Trek, I like to quote Scotty, the engineer, who said, uh, in essence, in Star Trek III, the more they overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain. And that's been one of the problems we've had with security. We've made it so complex for the users and for the operators in the server rooms and we've driven up costs and we've lowered our security. Um, so implementing zero trust, you can, with the proper technology, people, and processes all put in place, you can actually retire some of those antique systems like VPNs and network access uh, control. VPNs entered the marketplace around 1996. So if I do the math, and I'm using Two Hills Law, which says one human year equals 25 computer years, Arguably, VPN technology is over 500 years old uh, using Two Hills Law. Why would I want to continue to use technology that chokes my firewalls, that is extremely expensive from an OPEX and CAPEX, and further requires a great deal of manpower, and we don't have enough cyber workforce anyway? Folks who implement zero trust uh, and using techniques like software-defined perimeters are able to lower their cost of operation by 50 to 75 percent. So you've made some compelling arguments for the benefit of zero trust. Let's talk about the other side of the equation. What are the risks in implementing zero trust? Are there any that you can see or you can envision or that organizations need to be aware of? Well, first of all, some folks try to implement it all in one fell swoop. You can't uh, eat an elephant in one bite. You have to have the game plan and take it one bite at a time. And my recommendation is, first of all, you have to get a good handle on what is your information's worth. Uh, what are your high value assets? And secure your high value assets using the zero trust strategy first and then move forward as you build uh, confidence and experience across your organization. And uh, as you try to move forward with that strategy, remember that it's a continuous strategy. You're continually assessing, you're continuously improving. Uh, we're finding that mature organizations that are implementing some of those principles and uh, you know, great examples are in Rackspace and Datadog, uh, Norwegian Cruise Line's done some great work. Uh, we're seeing ExxonMobil move, moving forward quickly. They go and they have a very incremental approach. They're dedicated to it and uh, they move forward uh, quickly, but not all at once. So that was kind of my next question. I've heard through the rumor mill that the zero trust is oftentimes this kind of rip and replace methodology, but it sounds like that's not the case. No, it's a journey like any other strategy. And uh, when you focus on the tactics 
you always will lose the war. You have to focus on the strategy, the tactics, and make sure that you have a coherent plan of action to get to where you need to be. That makes sense. Let's talk, now talk a little bit about cost. Is it expensive to implement zero trust? I mean, again, I'm thinking about this from an organization that's got an existing perimeter-based mantra mentality when it comes to protecting their resources. What are they gonna be looking at in terms of cost structures? There's different ways to implement it. I find, though, that the most cost-effective way is with a software-defined perimeter model. And the reason being is, is your information's everywhere. Uh, as you take a look at software-defined networks, SD-WAN, and some of the other uh, things that are out there, you can implement zero-trust principles within those environments, but it doesn't cover your entire environment or your entire information uh, location. So as you take a look at uh, organizational goals, like I want to have a bring your own device, I want to have comply to connect, I want to go into hybrid clouds to uh, lower my OpEx and my CapEx, uh, most organizations uh, that are looking to better control costs but improve their security that see the greatest return on their investment are going into the software-defined uh, perimeter model, which is a very identity-centric approach. But no matter how you slice the, the bread, uh, you're going to have an initial uh, cost and your cost of operation should drop considerably. And I wouldn't buy any capability uh, for zero trust uh, implementation for my strategy that's not going to help force me to retire some of that ancient equipment. The, I mean, if you're going to just add another layer, it's not effective, it's not going to be efficient, and it's certainly not going to be secure in my mind. That makes a lot of sense. There's a, a term out there that's become somewhat popular in the last year or two called micro-segmentation. And I'm wondering, is zero trust the same as that or is it tied to it? How do you differentiate that? Segmentation is certainly a principle within the zero trust uh, security strategy. Micro-segmentation, and I'm a huge proponent and fan of micro-segmentation. Micro-segmentation takes your segmentation down to the individual. You know, we talk about segmenting your network and saying, okay, over here you've got like government employees, over here you've got contractors, over here you may have foreign nationals. Over, and then further, as you take a look at your information stores, you can say, uh, I've got my highly sensitive contract information over here, I've got my uh, HIPAA information for my healthcare, I've got my personal information, I've got my PCI, DSS, you know, for my credit card information. Segmenting by type of information is critically important, but micro-segmenting where everything is tagged, everything is uh, identified, everything is logged, seems to be uh, the state of the art, and I'm gonna state right out, I believe that micro-segmentation really is the state of the art with zero trust. So they're complementary or they're part of the same solution? Absolutely. I see, I see, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like, Jim, if, if you're gonna have a, a lens, I can look through a uh, lens and see a, a large picture, but if I focus it tighter and tighter, I can see a whole lot more. Micro-segmentation gives us the ability to focus all the way down to the pixel on the TV set, and that limits my risk exposure when I can do the micro-segmentation down to that pixel and it's even better when I can make it to the individual. So uh, maybe moving off in a slightly different uh, line of thought, you know, the cloud is a big deal today. And I, everything that I've heard us kind of talk about thus far, I've kind of focused on what we think of as like on-prem, on-premise, where organizations might do it on their own internal network. How does zero trust apply to the cloud? Is, is it, does it support it or is it something that you just can't do in a cloud environment? No, you should be able to do zero trust regardless where your information is. And there's uh, zero trust activities going on in the cloud all the time. Uh, the fact of life is, is a, a lot of us operate in, uh, in the cloud every day without perhaps even knowing it. You know, if you log into uh, Netflix, for example, or Amazon Prime, you're pulling information out of the cloud. If you're using Gmail or Office 365, you're in the cloud. If you're doing electronic commerce, you're in the cloud. Cloud is a fact of life, and your information is distributed across it. Enterprises that are doing their business in the cloud, and that could be a public sector or a private sector enterprise, need to make sure that uh, when they are in the cloud and operating in the cloud, that they're implementing those zero trust security strategy principles as well. And that's a better investment 
in security, but it's also a better investment in cost and making sure that you have cost control on your OpEx and CapEx. There's some folks that have gone into the cloud and have realized that with the explosive growth of their, their data, it made a little bit more sense to have a private cloud as opposed to a public cloud. So that's an area too where you can apply those zero trust uh, strategies in both public and private clouds. And uh, the folks that are really innovative and on the cutting edge of leveraging the cloud, they're leveraging zero trust. Makes sense, makes sense. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some integration considerations. Um, you know, a lot of our customers out there today have existing standards from like NIST or from like ISO. How do you, are, are, how do you integrate those existing control frameworks into zero trust? Are there considerations that have to be taken into account? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And frankly, I don't see them as being uh, mutually exclusive. I see zero, uh, the zero trust security strategy is complementing the standards that you normally see out there with some of the standards, including ISO, PCI DSS, GDPR, all the acronym souped uh, uh, standards that are out there. And the folks out of Forrester Research who actually own the rights to the Zero Trust uh, name and uh, are the, the central focal point for Zero Trust uh, research under Dr. Chase Cunningham, they've got uh, a lot of great examples of where folks are in fact using zero trust and are congruent with those standards that are out there from industry and uh, governments alike. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, NIST and their new special publication 800-207. They released I believe last month in February draft two of it. Mm -hmm. How does that track from what you're seeing in terms of actual deployments out there at customer sites? I think uh, the 800-207 is a superior document. I actually like the first version better than the second version, okay. but that's me because I'm kind of like that zero trust purist. Um, but zero trust uh, uh, is something that is gaining attention as it should. And uh, you know, frankly, while I was still in public service, we were trying to move towards that direction. And uh, you know, Grant Schneider and the new team have uh, been uh, carrying forward on that. Uh, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted with where we're heading on it. Uh, the difference between zero trust uh, in version one and zero trust in version two was predominantly the acknowledgement that there's other mo methods than the purest model of, hey, control your own information, control your own uh, processing, control your own gateways. And incorporating in zero trust when you are offloading some of that workload to a managed security provider. We have a lot of MSSPs that are out there. Uh, we've got some cloud-based MSSPs. So version two incorporates, well, how do you do zero trust when you're handing off some of your security to somebody else? And the uh, second version addresses some of those things. Uh, but once again, I feel that version one actually I thought was a, a better copy, but that's just me. Well, with that, we're going to go ahead and end today's uh, session. General Tuhill, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and end today's show. We appreciate you joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again on a future episode of Cybersecurity Today. Please feel free to learn more about the show by visiting www.cybersecuritytoday.org. Thanks again. Have a great day.